had to get my last promotional tweet in before we started. <laughs> Thank you. Close the, um, yeah, she can stay, but can you make sure you close the drape too, because the light leaks out. Hi there. Hi. Welcome. Thank you. So I think we, I, we have everyone except Senator Wyden. Oh, and Jake Stauffer. No, I think Jake's here. Is he here? I think so. I saw him. Yeah, I'm in, guys. I apologize. Hey, Jake. <laughs> hey, how, how's it going? Good. Good to see you. Does anybody know how to minimize? Sorry. We're all live right now, and we're going to start in two minutes. So we need to mute our phones, if our Zoom calls for now. We'll be starting with Alyssa and Senator Wyden. Can we all talk? <laughs> Are we allowed to talk? <laughs> no, we're supposed to look serious. Welcome, Senator. Get, get started, Senator. You, Senator, we're about to get you, started. If you mute a senator, that's like practically <laughs> comprehensible. I mean, isn't that what McConnell does anyway? Don't get Somebody just my mind. <laughs> Don't get me started. <laughs> Welcome everyone to our event tonight, the fight for election security. My name is John Bonifaz. I'm the president of Free Speech for People. We're proud to be co-hosting uh, this event uh, with the Electronic Frontier Foundation tonight. And we have a very distinguished uh, group of panelists uh, for this discussion on the Kill Chain documentary film which has just come out on HBO uh, and is free for viewing on YouTube through May 25th and on the fight for election security. We're gonna get started with our opening speakers and we're thrilled to have as our first opening speaker, Alyssa Milano. Uh, Alyssa is an American actress, activist, producer, author, and entrepreneur. Uh, for years, she has been raising her voice in the defense of our democracy and for the need for secure, reliable, and verifiable elections. Alyssa, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you. Am I muted? Let's see. You are on. All right. Thank you uh, so much for, for having me and thank you to everyone who has joined us for this, uh, I would say incredibly important panel discussion on what is one of the most uh, fundamental issues that our nation faces today. And um, which has become even more, I would say, um, critical in the midst of, of this current public health crisis. Uh, I, don't, I don't say that hyperbolically. If you are working on any other issue, whether it be equal pay, um, climate change, healthcare, women's rights, uh, racial justice, better education, corporate accountability, prison reform, and on and on and on and on and on. Every single issue ultimately depends on the ability of the people to make their voices heard throughout their votes. 
you know, if we can't have our votes cast as intended and counted as cast, we won't be able to have our voices heard and we won't be able to determine our own destinies through our democracy. And um, anyone who follows me on, on Twitter or social media knows that this is an issue that I've been shouting about um, from the rooftops and in all caps. Uh, I recently actually hosted a, an episode of my, my podcast, Sorry Not Sorry, on this issue um, on April 6th entitled Hacking the Vote, Protecting Our Elections. Um, you know, and I think that it would scare the pants off of you. I highly recommend you go listen to it. Um, but I did it not to scare people because I think that uh, those on the other side can actually use that fear to um, make sure they repress the vote by saying that their votes won't count or that elections are not secure. But I did it because we really need to get people educated and engaged to really demand that our leaders and election officials once and for all, you know, just dump these insecure, hackable, untrustworthy, uh, unverifiable and expensive voting machines. You know, and we need to adopt the systems and protocols that computer scientists and uh, national security experts have been in, uh, advising for years. Um, the, what that is, very simple, hand-marked paper ballots and routine, mandatory, robust post-election audits of every election to serve as a, as a check on the computer generated results. We need to get people involved and educated and empowered to fight and to do that. The more I learn about this issue, the more uh, frightening it is to me and the more motivated I am to try to make this change um, and it's, one of the many reasons why I'm so happy to be introducing this amazing panel that we'll be discussing, um, I think one of the most important and maybe even the scariest movies that you'll see this year, um, it's HBO's documentary, Kill Chain, The Cyber War on America's Elections. Uh, I found that unfortunately, uh, this this is not an issue that is sexy. Um, it's hard to really get people to listen to it um, because it can tend to be a little wonky. Um, and you hear a lot of computer scientists or tedious details of, of election administration, despite the, the dire nature really of this topic. And um, I think Kill Chain, uh, brings this issue to life in a way that briefing papers and, and lengthy uh, reports can't. You know, not only does Kill Chain provide a, a, a compelling and um, animated narrative explaining the, the horrifying truth of our voting machines, it really uncovers some previously un- known information that um, again is 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 really scary. So um, I hope that you'll you'll watch the movie. I hope that you'll listen to the episode of my podcast. I hope that you will do everything you can to not only educate yourself um, but also use your platforms. Everyone has a platform to educate and empower um, other people about this issue. So I'd really like to thank the producers and uh, the participants in Kill Chain for, for making this film to really just, um, you know, show the public exactly how, how fragile our election system is and why we need, we need to rise up and use our voices and demand reforms uh, and especially now. 
So please, if you haven't seen it yet, you can watch it and please get your family members and friends to watch it. It's streaming right now on YouTube for free until May 25th. Um, uh, I also, I wanna thank our event sponsors, um, Free Speech for the People or Free Speech for People and Electronic Frontier Foundation for uh, putting together this awesome event and for the work that they've done to secure our ele elections and make this an issue that is just a little bit more palatable and sexy. Um, EFF was involved in helping to make Kill Chain and bring it to you and Free Speech for People is working really on so many fronts, uh, including co-leading litigation in Pennsylvania and North Carolina to prevent the use of insecure voting machines in those states for 2020. Um, obviously, we need the work of these organizations to help protect our elections. Um, election officials have been slow walking a response to this uh, to this national security crisis ever since we learned that Russian hackers were actively targeting our elections back in 2016. And I, I just feel like we can't sit back and wait for them anymore. We need to, again, stand up and, and fight, fight, fight to protect our right to vote and demand security, transparency, um, and auditing of all elections. So thanks for listening. And it is my pleasure to introduce someone who is not sitting back and has really been fighting for election protection for the long haul. Senator Ron Wyden of Oregon has been a, uh, a beacon of hope and outspoken tenacity in the US Senate, introducing uh, legislation such as the Protecting American Votes and Elections, or um, the PAVE Act, which incorporates uh, really the most effective and innovative ways to protect our elections and ensure accessibility for all voters. So thank you, Senator Wyden, for joining us tonight. Alyssa, thank you. And uh, that was unquestionably an inflationary introduction. And I so appreciate your leading the activist call on so many important issues. And I think as I reflect on the wonderful people you just mentioned who made this program possible, now, I went to school on a basketball scholarship. I was dreaming of playing in the NBA. It was a ridiculous idea because at 6'4", I was too small, and I made up for it by being really slow. But I can tell you tonight, we really have the NBA all-stars of election security. And my mother probably would say, Ron Deere, tonight you're running with the right crowd. And I think that really sums up my feelings about all of you. <clears throat> Let me start by saying that the timing for your program could not be more ideal tonight. Probably about 12 hours ago, the Senate Intelligence Committee finished our hearing on the new nominee to head the National Intelligence Office, John Ratcliffe. And I had read his written answers to our questions. And he basically thought that online voting was pretty much okay. And I think all of you know that internet voting where there's an open connection to the internet is pretty much like stacking our ballots in the Kremlin. So I asked him, his opinion on online voting, given what he had said. And the person who is likely to head the Office of National Intelligence pretty much said, not my lane, that's policy. And what I really wanted to say, but I said it more diplomatically, 
was, are you kidding me? These are national security issues. I don't understand how anybody who looked at what happened in 2016 wouldn't see that elections are national security issues. So one special reason I wanted to join tonight is to make sure that all of us make it clear that online voting just is not safe and it's not acceptable to have a new director of national intelligence who doesn't understand that basic proposition. Now, what is exciting about this program is that those who are featured in Kill Chain have been sounding the alarm for years and years. And for a little bit of my infamous past, I guess I could describe it, one of the first things I did a number of years ago is I sent letters to all of the big voting machine companies, basically the waterfront of the voting machine lobby. And I asked them some really tough questions, just brimming with difficulty, like, do you have a chief information security officer? Boy, that is really, really tough to address. I asked, has your company ever experienced a data breach or a hack? These companies across the board refused to answer. They basically considered themselves to this very evening above the law. And that's why Kill Chain and what we're talking about in terms of upcoming legislation is so important because this is gonna help us get real accountability over the very powerful voting machine lobby that really does think it is above the law. Now, a few months after I sent that letter, the New York Times reported that the biggest voting machine manufacturer, ES&S, had installed remote access software on some of their election equipment. Now, when I learned that, I said, this is about the worst move for election security I could imagine. I guess you could gift ballot boxes to Moscow, but other than that, this was about as serious a mistake as you could get. What'd the company do? They denied the New York Times story. Then we kept following it up. And they finally admitted to me that they did install remote access software on election management systems for at least seven years. But they said, no big deal, not to worry. It's just a few systems. Then <clears throat> a few months later, they admitted it was 300 customers. So the largest voting machine company in the country had changed its story on these basic issues three times in one year. Now, that's not the end of it. They've used every slimy trick in the book to get states to buy what Alyssa was warning about. Overpriced, insecure voting machines. The company was investigated by prosecutors in 2009 for using bribes to get a $50 million contract with New York City. The company's got a well-documented track record of flying state election officials to nice places, lots of whining and dining. Americans' constitutional rights, as this group knows, shouldn't depend on a handful of well-connected corporations like ES&S, who have stonewalled the Congress lied to the Congress and the press and shown questionable judgment when it comes to security. Last summer, I had a chance to see just how vulnerable election systems are where I attended DEF CON, the white hat hacker convention in Las Vegas. 
I went there because I wanted to see how easy it was to hack e-poll books, voting machines, and other parts of election infrastructure. And there the security researchers and the cyber experts showed how easy it was to compromise the machines, alter the votes, disrupt ballot printers, meddle with the registration systems. Teenagers were in the DEF CON voting village and they showed me an e-poll book hacked so completely that young people were playing video games on it. They're playing Doom on it. I can tell you, 1% of the United States Senate was represented that day at DEF CON, and I know DEF CON folks are with us tonight, but I sure wish my colleagues, my other colleagues in the Senate could have been there. The threats to democracy grow day by day, and the fact is Mitch McConnell and Donald Trump just repeatedly stonewall, block, and in every way possible, try to derail bills to protect the franchise, expand the franchise, and COVID proof the 2020 elections so that our people are safe. Now my bill, Alyssa talked about it, paper ballots, hand-marked, routine post-election risk limiting audits, and federal cybersecurity standards for election systems. And I actually went to the Senate floor and I asked unanimous consent to be able to debate whether there should be a cybersecurity standard stipulating that you couldn't have a voting machine with an open connection to the internet. And Marsha Blackburn, Senator from Tennessee, went to the floor and objected. And in objecting, she said, I don't even want to debate it. I don't even want to debate an issue like that that goes right to the heart of what computer security specialists say is so important. Now, the House did pass a major election security bill. It was called the SAFE Act. Speaker Pelosi, to her credit, worked very closely with Congresswoman Lofgren and myself to include significant portions of our bill. Mitch McConnell keeps putting those bills on ice. And basically, his goal, in my view, is to just postpone, 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 so you can run out the clock and try to keep election security reform from passing for this election. So that's why this program and the discussion you're gonna have is so important. Political change is not top down, certainly not with election security. It doesn't start in Washington and then trickle down. It is really grassroots up. And I will tell you, tonight, I feel we've got a better shot than we've ever had. <clears throat> and I'll close with this. I'm the nation's first mail-in United States Senator. I'm a Democrat. Second one was a Republican. Vote by mail has been tested. It's exactly what we need right now to prevent more spectacles in November, like we saw in Wisconsin, where the health commissioner has already indicated a number of people got infected during that period when the elections were taking place. I believe we can win this. We've seen a number of local Republican officials, like Mike DeWine of Ohio, Governor Hogan of Maryland, we've seen a number of them say, the safety of our voters is more important than Mitch McConnell's turf. So what you're doing today, tonight, and in the days ahead as people see this wonderful production is really giving us a chance to go to the grassroots and say, let's keep our people safe. Let's COVID proof the elections. Let's not make it easy for hostile foreign powers 
to interfere with our elections. So, as I said when I started, I'm thrilled to be part of this effort. I think we can win this. When I put that vote by mail bill in in 2002, it was an academic exercise. Professors on college campuses wore tweed jackets and they debated whether we ought to vote by mail. It is no longer an academic issue. It's a front and center public safety issue. It is a national security issue. Thank you, thank you, thank you for all you're doing. And I want you to know, I'm gonna be working with you every step of the way. Thanks for having me, everybody. Thank you, Senator, so much for your eloquent remarks. You are a champion for democracy as is Alyssa Milano. We're so thrilled to have both of you open up this critical discussion. We know you both are very busy and we may, may not be able to stay uh, for the rest of the hour, but we appreciate you taking the time uh, and, and starting this critical question. Thank you for your continued leadership you. in the U.S. Senate, Senator. Thank you. We are now gonna to move to our panel uh, discussion. Uh, and as I start off with the introductions for that, I do wanna make sure everyone who's viewing knows that we welcome your questions. Uh, whether you're viewing on Facebook, on Twitch or YouTube, please, if you have a question, write that on uh, the, type it in on that page and we will work to field as many of the questions as possible during the Q&A section. Uh, so we'll start now uh, with the panel discussion, uh, and that will lead off with the producers and directors of the HBO documentary, Kill Chain, uh, with Russell Michael, Simon Artizoni, and Sarah Teal. Simon and T Sarah both with us tonight, produced the documentary, Hacking Democracy, which aired on HBO in 2006, in which Ari Hursty, who's also on the panel tonight, showed you how you could flip the vote using only a memory card. Uh, despite the fact that Hari's hack was reproduced by security experts across America, we then came to 2016. And following the election of, of 2016 and all the questions around what happened there, including all the foreign interference, Russ, Simon, and Sarah decided that the country now needed to have, uh, you know, another important movie on this question. So they produced and directed Kill Chain, the cyber war on America's elections, uh, which initially aired on HBO on March 26, as Alyssa highlighted, is now free to view on the HBO YouTube channel through May 25th. So I'm gonna turn it over to Sarah and Simon to lead us off on this panel discussion. Thank you both for the amazing movie you've made and for starting us off tonight on this panel. Thank you, John. <clears throat> it's interesting what uh, Senator Wyden said about remote access, um, because as Hari found, um, as others that were in our film, Ryan Varner of Semantic found, there were remote access um, abilities in all the voting machines that we looked at. But Simon, if you would like to also mention what that, what we then found, why that is such a problem. Sure. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and uh, thank you so much, John, for inviting us. It's, it's a great honor. Um, but when we, we started making this film uh, three years ago, um, and, and get back coming up for four years ago now, and um, the, the, one of the first things that happened was that no one would talk to us. Uh, we got so stonewalled. Um, and it's very telling that whereas we managed to uh, interview uh, such luminaries as uh, Senator Wyden and colleagues, other colleagues from the US Senate, uh, the voting machine companies, uh, many local election officials just simply refused to talk to us in any shape or form whatsoever. And so we started digging around following up a lot of leads. Um, and we ended up filming across nine states in the US. And um, quite a lot of that didn't end up in the film for one reason or another but there was one theme that kept on coming back and back and back and that was remote access in all sorts of ways um 
the, the, the first way that it came through was uh, Hari and other computer scientists um, were doing a deep dive into the voting machines themselves. Um, and what we found there was really very extraordinary. Um, it wasn't just that they obviously do connect to the, inter to the internet as the film shows when the voting machine companies are saying they don't connect to the internet. Um, but it was also that there were so many different ways that they would connect. And it's not just that the voting machine then has a door that you can open, whether it's through a USB key or through a network or through FTP, all, these, all of these things were identified um, and they're all bad. But it's also that in order for a computer to be able to open that door, you have an entire code base, you have a, a set of programs that do that. And they themselves are an open door because they can be insecure as well, they can be hacked. And so you, you have uh, what security experts call a very wide attack surface. You can attack it in so many different ways. And, and we found evidence um, of this all over the place and none of it we could ever really um, uh, say definitively this has been hacked uh, because nobody would talk to us and no one would share any of the evidence. Um, but I think there are a couple of places which I would, you know, one in particular is, is Raleigh, Raleigh Durham County. Raleigh had a big meltdown um, in, um, in uh, 2016. And it turned out that during that meltdown, uh, a company called VR Systems, who were based in Florida, in Tallahassee, Florida, had kind of phoned in in order to try and fix those systems. VR Systems uh, had almost certainly been hacked uh, by the GRU in, a, in, a, in, a, in an extensive campaign in the run up to the 2016 election. Um, and this is awful, 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 awful thing to happen. Um, and I'm sorry that it couldn't get into the film. And, and thinking about why all this matters, um, you'll be hearing from uh, Professor Philip Stark um, a bit later on. Um, and, and Philip really, when we, were, when we were filming with him, he really caused a, a major change in my thinking on this, which is that you shouldn't really think about voting machines as producing a result of who wins. Uh, or indeed a whole voting system, you should be thinking about what is the quality of the evidence that this system, this whole system is actually producing. Because if you can trust that evidence in exactly the same way that if you can trust evidence in a court or evidence in a financial audit, then you don't have a problem. You agree with the result and, and on we go. Um, but we've seen what starts to happen. We've just started to see when people don't trust the result, when they don't trust the evidence from that system, from those machines, from that technology. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Sarah, did you wanna add anything further? Well, I just wanted to add about one thing that was also not in the film that we had been waiting, and there's been a recent change. Um, we had been waiting for Jill Stein in 2016 had put all of the voting machines in Wisconsin on hold because clearly something happened in Wisconsin that was not accurate, not right. So she sued to have those machines put on ice basically so that Hari and Alex Holderman could take a look and see what happened. Um, the voting machine companies have been fighting this uh, ever since, but um, Hari and Alex remained hopeful. And there was recently a court order that said that, um, that Wisconsin, that they had to let them have a look at those machines. And the importance of that is that, that perhaps we might be able to find out what did happen in Wisconsin. So there are things that are coming down the pike that was not in the film, we were waiting for that to happen, but um, here it is four years later, and it still hasn't, but hopefully it will. Um, and we should all look out for that because then, then Hari and Alex can get in there and really look at some machines that were used in the 2016 election. Great, thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Simon. Uh, our, our next speaker is Hari Hursty. As you know, he appeared prominently in this film. Hari is a world-renowned 
data security expert, internet visionary, and serial entrepreneur. He began his career as the prodigy behind the first commercial public email and online forum system in Scandinavia. He founded his first company at the age of 13 and went on to co-found EUNet Finland in his mid-20s. He is among the world's leading authority in the areas of election voting security and critical infrastructure and network system security. Thank you, Hari, for joining us. Thank you for having me. Uh, it has been a very interesting journey because I really didn't have any, uh, I didn't uh, believe in the problems of election security and I, I didn't have a any kind of burn uh, to get involved back in 2004 when I was first time asked. And the journey very quickly showed to me that uh, the situation is unbelievable. And still today, if somebody would be trying to tell me and convince me to believe everything I have know right now as a fact, I wouldn't believe myself if I wouldn't have been experienced myself. Uh, everything we are communicating publicly is still needing to be toned and a lot of details are too complex to grasp. And always when you have the whole picture, it is in this area, it's even worse than anything which is communicated. So when I say I wouldn't believe it, there are a right below the surface of what is discussed in the public, there is another layer and multiple other layers which are uncomprehensible for security experts, uncomprehensible for people who need to deal with any kind of system of uh, systems of seriousness, critical infrastructure, dealing matters, uh, matters of life and death. Uh, I mean, only other space where uh, things are really outdated and bad as these are medical systems in hospitals. Uh, that's another place which is a dark place to, to look from security perspective. Uh, when we started, and uh, Jeff is here, Jeff Moss, uh, when we started DEF CON uh, Voting Machine Hacking Village, uh, before that, there was a very small group of people who were privileged, and my co-founder, Matt Lace being one of them, we were privileged to be part of Secretary of State or a, a court, uh, a commission studies to look into the voting machines. And basically everything we saw was unbelievable. Uh, we tried to communicate it, but there were so many noises, so many contradicting messages, so much misinformation and disinformation around that it was very hard to get the message through. So when we had the, the village, that enabled people to experience, learn, learn some. We never wanted to prove voting machines or needed to prove the voting machine be hacked. We always knew everything in the room will be hacked. The question was to let people to do it and experience themselves. When we look about the uh, voting machines as a as, as whole, we have to understand a couple of things. First of all, we have been over-focusing, like the movie is focusing in the, how the actual votes are counted. Uh, the, that is only one part of the problem. The whole system, and if we look at everything we know right now in a public domain about the foreign actors attacking systems, not only in the United States, but also in the European Union, everybody has been going after back end systems and back office systems. The networks where the voter election definition systems are, uh, election management systems are, uh, electronic poll books, program, voter registration reporting. So we are actually uh, shining a light to one area of the, of the system. If we look at the election infrastructure as a whole, we, all, we always think that there is an election office. The election office has an IT department, and the IT department probably have a few security people looking into security. Nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, most of the United States, when you look at the election office, that, there's not a single full-time IT person on a payroll. Uh, a lot of things are outs outsourced, a lot of things are run by volunteers. Now, that is already bad. But then you realize that IT people, generally speaking, don't know much about security. Um, security people are completely different breed, we think differently, and we make people's life difficult, uh, difficult because we want to keep things secure instead of convenient. Uh, so. Right now, when we look all the technology we since Help America Vote Act of 2002 have come to an election environment, what we really would need to have is an IT department 
with a strong election, a uh, strong uh, a, a executive practice, which just happens to do elections. But we are not there. Uh, the local election officials, there are a lot of good people, completely, they don't have access to the resources. They don't have access to the funding. They are trying to do the best they can with what they have, but they are seriously uh, a, a undermined by what they can do. And if we look at uh, the asymmetric nature of the cyberspace, every other war we fight is in a natural domain, land, sea, underwater, air, space. Cyberspace is the only man-made domain, which means that the laws of nature, the laws of common sense, don't work the same way as we have used to when we are thinking about a natural uh, phenomenon. So it's a man-made domain with no borders. We have artificial borders called firewalls, but they are not any shape or form replacing what really a, 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 a border or land border or a barrier would look like and what it will do, or gravity or other forces of nature. So in that sense, we are in the territory, which is very hard to grasp if you are not professional. Second part of this is we are also, we are so many different ways having, when I started, the threat model was wrong. The threat model was a dishonest candidate or supporters of, 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 of a, a candidate who are trying to get their candidate to win. That didn't get into account what nation state would do, uh, disruptors would do who don't care who wins, just want to create chaos. And, and again, uh, one nation, uh, the common wisdom about that nation is that they are not playing to win. They are playing for everybody else to lose. So again, if you look at the threat model and the thinking, that kind of adversary is very dangerous because you don't count into the methods because you don't understand deeply and get into account what, is the, uh, what are the, the principles and goals. And I will leave with one final thing where, uh, which is, I, I believe is very important. Elections are the cornerstone of democracy. Um, the democracy is a system which the fundamental promise is uh, to ensure a peaceful transition power after people have expressed their wishes by voting. Peaceful transition of power is only possible if the losing parties and the support of losing ideas accept the, the result as a fair uh, representation of people's will. So elections are not about who wins. It's about making certain that the people who didn't get their way, who were supporting a losing idea, accept the results as a fair representation of people's will. And when you follow that thought, then you come in the place where, yes, we have to improve the security of the, of the election infrastructure. But we, what we really want to have is transparency to the results. Make sure then that we, because the results are the things which actually matter at the end of the day. While we have done everything to secure and done everything there, most important is the transparency and open process, which will prove everyone, both the ones who got it their way this time and the people who didn't get it this way, they were this way, everybody trusting that the results were fair and square. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hari. And thank you for all your leadership on this question for so many years. Our next speaker on this panel is Jeff Moss. Uh, Jeff also, as you know, appeared in this film, uh, also known as Dark Tangent. He, Jeff is an American hacker, computer and internet security expert who founded the Black Hat and DEF CON computer security conferences. Jeff, thank you for joining us. Okay, we're unmuted. Thank you for having me. And uh, hey, Harry, good to see you again. Likewise. Um, yeah, thanks for having me on the panel. Um, so it's kind of hard to follow up all the, the good points that the previous speakers have made, but just a couple of uh, observations from my, my point. After watching the movie, it was interesting that there really wasn't a discussion on the law. And I can understand that that's also another nuts and bolts kind of down the rabbit hole thing. But if you look at why the DEF CON uh, voting machine village was even possible in the first place, it was because a change in the DMCA law decriminalized hacking election machines. Uh, before that, it was impossible 
for hackers to play with any of this stuff without potentially uh, being legally liable. And the voting machine manufacturers use this to a great extent. They would intimidate anybody that thought about reverse engineering the machine um, and send cease and desist letters, just be really bad actors. And only when the, the law changed did the floodgates open. And just like the movie Kill Chain, sort of the right place at the right time for the 2020 election, DEF CON, we were in the right place at the right time. Um, Hari had discovered this pile, this mountain of TSX machines that just happened to be for sale because a roof collapsed in a rainstorm and all the TSX machines got surplus uh, because of insurance. The law changed. Um, I knew Hari and Matt and we, I went out and bought all these machines on eBay and it was just a lucky circumstance that all this came together at just the right time. If that hadn't happened, um, we would still be stuck in a very academic uh, debate. And that frightens me that so much is dependent on fate. Um, the other thing is this exception, the DMCA exception is renewable and, and it was renewed, but there's no certainty that it won't continue, it won't in the future expire. And then all of a sudden we'll be back in the dark ages of being allowed to look at these machines. Um, the other thing is there's also the, the machines themselves work under um, a certification regime where they're certified at a date and time, let's say 2006, and then they can't be touched, they can't be updated, nothing can happen to them unless they're recertified. So therefore they never get updates, they never get patches, they're just frozen in time, you know, in amber as we say. And that's really dangerous and doesn't reflect reality anymore. But until that certification regime changes, if you want to use machines, you're going to be stuck in this sort of uh, historic past, you know, uh, with using relics. Um, and then finally, the one thing that does, is really refreshing is that there's absolutely certainty amongst all the experts that we, the answer is hand marked paper ballots and risk limiting audits. That part of the debate at least is not contentious. Um, it might get contentious if you start talking about mail-in ballots and the problems with mail-in ballots. Um, but their strengths far outweigh the weaknesses. So anyway, it's been a fascinating journey. I mean, we had first had some of the vote hacking talks at DEF CON, I think in 2005, Bev Harris did a black box voting talk. Um, this is well-researched, well-understood in the hacking areas. And it's so frustrating when you hear rep uh, representatives or other people say, boy, we were blindsided. Well, you weren't paying attention. You weren't listening to people. But it's not a secret, and it hasn't been a secret for 15 years. Um, so the question now is, what do we do about it? And I think one of the points that Hari touched on is the risk model has changed. But the other thing is, we spend a lot of time talking about nation states hacking voting machines. That's just one piece of the puzzle. If they're not hacking voting machines just to hack voting machines or cause consternation around the vote itself, they're doing this as part of a larger campaign, right? If you take all the election systems hacking and roll it up and wrap it in a circle on a Venn diagram, that's one part of a bigger puzzle. It's a larger, it's a piece of their overall objective. And if we keep treating it as a singular item, we're gonna be outmaneuvered. It's really part of a, a overall strategy to undermine uh, democracies. And I think we need to keep that in mind instead of getting fixated on one particular type of technology or another. Know that this is just one front in a multi-front uh, war. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, our next speaker is Courtney Hosteller. Courtney is the Council for Free Speech for People. She has been instrumental in helping to lead our election security work, including the case we recently filed in North Carolina with the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights on behalf of the North Carolina NAACP and individual voters challenging insecure and unreliable voting systems in that state. Courtney. Hi, thank you for having me. And thank you to all the experts who've already spoken for shedding a light on how these machines work and don't work. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about the lawsuits that we brought and the way that we can use the 
effective vehicle to change uh, the use of these machines. Our laws at the state level and the federal level give us the right to be able to vote in a manner that is secure, reliable, and effective. And nobody should have to wonder when they go to the polls if the choice they made was the choice that was actually cast and counted. And nobody should be forced to wait in lines, possibly giving up their right to even get to the polls because of machine malfunctions or shortages due to breakdowns or lack of revenue for enough machines. This means paper ballots. And it also means that anybody who requires or prefers an assistive device to vote should be able to vote on a machine that is as secure as possible and subject to rigorous oversight and accountability measures and verification. Too many voters don't have this. They're required to vote on insecure, unreliable, and unverifiable machines. Um, but again, the courts can be a really effective vehicle to change this. And so I want to talk a little bit about what we're doing to challenge the use of two versions of the express vote, which is a ballot marking device currently manufactured by ESNS. Uh, one of them is being used in Pennsylvania, the express vote XL, and another in North Carolina, a different version of the express vote. So in North, in Pennsylvania, Free Speech for People is working with pro bono counsel Baker Hostetler uh, to bring a suit against the Secretary of the Commonwealth on behalf of the National Election Defense Coalition, Citizens for a Better Election, and individual Pennsylvania voters challenging the XL. Uh, the Express Vote XL is a really problematic machine. It's what we call an all-in-one ballot marking device. It's a machine where voters have to make their choices on, a com on the screen of a computer, that machine then prints out a small piece of paper that gives a summary of their vote um, and then a bar and prints a barcode. And then that same machine will then read the barcode and the barcode sup is supposed to contain the voters choices. The voter can look at their choice in behind glass. They can look at that piece of paper behind glass, but they can't look at close at it. And most importantly, they can't read the barcode. They can't read what's actually getting counted by the machine. It's a really problematic machine. Um, and it's it's been certified since 2018. It led to serious problems most recently in November 2019, uh, when in Northampton County, a major error was caught only because it produced a really extremely extreme and obviously implausible result. But our real concern are the more subtle errors that might never be caught, um, because often elections can be changed not with enormous gaps, but changing only a few a few votes or a small percentage of votes or an error that keeps only you know keeps people from one county away from the polls due to malfunctions so we are in the stage of litigation where we're pushing forward uh, we would like to see um, the counties that are using the express vote xl uh, enjoined and required to choose a different certified system ahead of these crucial November elections. Unfortunately, the state of Pennsylvania is resisting um, resisting moving the litigation forward. They're seeking a stay of the entire lawsuit um, in part because of the current pandemic, which is a real concern because actually the machines are gonna cause um, additional challenges to voters, health concerns uh, in this pandemic, uh, which brings us to North Carolina. It's uh, because in North Carolina, we, we filed this lawsuit after the pandemic began and we're able to, in the complaint, discuss the ways that machines can actually create risks um, not only insecure elections, but also uh, risk the health of voters. In North Carolina, they're using a different version of the express vote. Um, it doesn't tabulate the vote itself. They use a different machine to do that, but it has the same real concern, which is that it prints a summary of the choices the voter made, we hope, and it also it also prints a barcode, which again, supposed is supposed to contain the voters' choices, but voters have absolutely no way to review that that's what's getting counted. They don't know what's in the barcode. It cannot be read by humans, but that's what the tabulating machines uh, that's what the tabulating machines count. In addition to this incredibly problematic uh, p element of the machine, the machine also features end of life software. There's go now going to be no patches or security offered by Microsoft by the end of the year. And so these machines, which were purchased uh, less, you know, just a few months ago, and will probably be in circulation in these counties for years, unless our lawsuit prevails, which we believe it should, um, 
is going to be end of life before the year's up, before these elections. There's a number of vulnerabilities in the, in the system that have already been identified. Um, there's already been delays that have been experienced in the primaries and some of the counties using it. And we believe that this, this is a vulnerable, insecure machine that no voter should be required to, to use. And so we're seeking to enjoin the counties that are currently using the express vote, um, which would require them to choose a different system. There are four, there are three other systems currently certified in North Carolina that do not require voters to use the express vote. In our complaint, we also talked about the pandemic because voting machines um, are going to cause new health risks during the pandemic, especially in these counties that are requiring everybody to use the express vote. We know the virus survives on glass and plastic, which means that in the counties that are using these machines, voters are going to be touching a surface that dozens or hundreds of people have touched throughout the day. It's going to put poll workers in a really difficult position. Do they clean the machine but after every use? sanitize it thoroughly, which can be a complicated and difficult endeavor. It's going to take time. It's going to slow things down. And that's going to create, that's potentially going to create lines and backups, which creates a risk of person to person transmission. Or do poll workers try to hurry things along, but maybe not clean the machines or not clean them thoroughly, which again is going to create the risk of transmission from the machine itself. It's also troubling because some of these machines, the way they're configured, I believe also in Mecklenburg County, which is the most populous county in the state, the poll worker actually has to go into the booth and set the machine up for each voter, which is going to put poll workers at risk and put voters at risk throughout the day. So we have real concern about the health, um, the health problems that might be related with requiring everybody to use these machines in the upcoming election. And we raise that in our complaint. And we believe it's gonna be an issue moving forward. Um, to that end, uh, Free Speech for People also recently worked with Dr. Joya Mukherjee and Mark Ritchie, who are two experts in this field. Dr. Mukherjee is a well-renowned physician and researcher and educator on infectious diseases and internal medicine at the Harvard School of Public Health and Massachusetts General Hospital. Mark Ritchie served as Minnesota's Secretary of State until 2015 and is currently sitting on the U.S. Election Assistance Board of Advisors. And in this report that they authored with Free Speech for People, we talked about what it what it will take to make votes, to make elections safe during the pandemic. And our purpose was to make sure that voters and election officials have all the information they need on the risk of virus transmission during elections, including on, including on voting machines, including standing in lines, um, and what steps, what, we, what steps we'll have to take to ensure that these risks are minimized or avoided to protect voters during the pandemic. Great. Thank you, Courtney. Uh, and so our closing speaker for this panel before we go into the Q&A session is Cindy Cohen. Cindy is the executive director of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. From 2000 to 2015, she served as EFF's legal director as well as its general counsel. Uh, she's been widely recognized uh, for her expertise. I'll just cite two examples in 2018, Forbes included Cindy as one of America's top 50 women in tech, and the National Law Journal in 2013 named her one of the 100 most influential lawyers in America, noting if Big Brother is watching, you better look out for Cindy Cohen. Cindy, thank you for joining us. Hi, thank you so much. Um, EFF is really proud to co-sponsor this event and to work with Free Speech for the People. This is an issue that's near and dear to our hearts and has been for um, a long time since since uh, since uh, way back uh, shortly after the Help America Vote Act was passed. Uh, we uh, we heard from people in the security community that the electronic voting machines that were going to be rolled out as a result of that law were horribly insecure. Um, and we've worked hard to um, support people like Hari and uh, the hackers at DEF CON and other people to be able to tell the truth uh, to people around the world about the insecurities of these systems. And as, as, as Jeff pointed out, um, the road has not been easy. Um, there, um, there, the systems are sold to election systems under an extremely proprietary model where um, the election administrators have to sign confidentiality agreements. There are trade secret claims. 
Um, and then of course there's the copyright claims, which as Jeff points out, we were able to uh, get a, a three year reprieve from under a, a copyright office process, but there's still terms of service limitations. There's threats of the computer crime law, the um, Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which is a horribly overbroad law. These are all laws that are threatened against um, the security researchers like Hari and others who are simply trying to tell all of us the truth about what's going on on our elections. Um, and this problem permeates um, the litigation where we see obstacles put in front of people trying to find out whether the systems worked or not. Um, and they it permeates the entire system. So one of the things that has been really important for us and that we've tried to do is to lift up the people who are doing this work. And I, I will say, um, including people maybe who make movies about uh, election system uh, uh, problems. Um, there is a, there is a, a really a, a highly unnecessary um, need to clear the pathway to telling the truth to people about security problems in their systems overall. And it's especially acute in election systems. Um, uh, the companies that sell them, as I think Senator Wyden did a good job kind of uh, giving us a flavor of the, the shady shadiness that happens in that sector sometimes. Um, so you've got a kind of a shady system, you've got overbroad laws, um, and you've got a lot of people who really don't who want to kind of cross their fingers and and think that election systems just magically work perfectly. Um, and so, uh, as Alyssa said, you know, this is this is a geeky issue. This is a nerdy issue. This is an issue where most people don't want to look. They want to think that the part of the election that's about campaigning is the only part that matters. And the part of the election that's about actually counting and figuring out what happens is kind of magic and just happens um, by happenstance, but it doesn't. Um, and it takes people like the people on this panel um, and frankly, the people listening uh, to raise their hands and say, look, we, we deserve better than this. This is, this, is a, this is something that, you know, happily humans broke so humans can fix. Um, and, um, and as Jeff said, the, ele the answers are fairly easy, you know, handmarked paper ballots um, with risk limiting audits, um, it will get us a long way. Um, and um, they're, they're not all that hard to do. Um, as Senator Wyden says, they do all mail voting in Oregon. There are definitely security issues if we want to scale that up nationally and we shouldn't, we shouldn't be starry eyed about them. But, uh, but that's the way that we should be putting some of our attention, at least in the short term. Um, so I, I'm really, we're really happy to be part of this and to lift up this work and, um, and excited to, to hear questions from the audience and, and some of the other people here. Great, thank you so much, Cindy. Uh, so we're now gonna turn to our Q&A session for this program. And we have a few additional special guests who are, are with us that I'm gonna start off the Q&A with and then turn it over to viewer questions we've been receiving. And again, if you have a question, please pose it on the platform where you're watching this, either Facebook, Twitch, or YouTube, and we will try to uh, get your question asked. Uh, the first question is to Susan Greenhall, our Senior Advisor on Election Security at Free Speech for People. Uh, Susan has previously served as Vice President of Programs at Verify Voting and at the National Election Defense Coalition advocating for secure election protocols, paper ballot voting systems, and post-election audits. And Susan's going to talk about, Susan, we, we took an action directly resulting from the Kill Chain documentary. Can you tell us about that action we've taken. Yes, thanks, John, and thanks everybody for joining us. And thank you so much to the rest of the panel and the people um, that made the movie Kill Chain. And uh, um, one of the things that we've seen over and over again in the issue of election security is that um, things kind of get glossed over and um, not um, examined, things that could be seriously problematic because we don't ask a lot of the questions. So some of the other work that we're doing at Free Speech for People, in addition to the lawsuit that uh, lawsuits that Courtney talked about is trying to shine a light on those areas and ask those questions and kill chain came up with um, or uncovered new information, which was really significant. Uh, one was specifically the fact that the Alaska voting system was hacked by a hacker from India who was able to get completely into the system into the election management system that's not supposed to be on the internet um, because it was um, inadequately 
because uh, it was it was actually connected to the overall online network and inadequately protected. Um, and the the U.S. Election Assistance Commission, which does the um, sort of nominal certification of voting machines, also had been hacked. Um, and the data that was retrieved by the hacker could potentially provide a roadmap to how um, existing uh, uh, vulnerabilities could be exploited and leveraged by hackers going forward. That's really serious stuff. So we wrote uh, to the um, House and Senate Intelligence and Homeland Security Committees and asked for them to launch an investigation into these um, revelations and, and uh, new information that came out of the Kill Chain documentary. It's a spoiler alert for, sorry for anyone that hasn't seen the movie yet. Now you really are, are incentivized to go and watch the movie further. So th thanks a lot. And thank you to, uh, to Simon and Sarah and Russ for uncovering that information so we could um, dig on it a little bit more. Thank you, Susan. And if you want to access that letter we've issued to those congressional committees, you can go to our blog at Free Speech for People where we posted it uh, this evening. Uh, our next uh, guest, special guest is Dr. Philip Stark, who, as you may know, if you've seen the movie, appeared in it. Uh, Dr. Philip Stark is a professor and associate dean of the School of Mathematics and Physical Sciences at University of California at Berkeley. He is the inventor of the post-election risk limiting audit, regarded as the gold standard for post-election auditing. Uh, he's featured in Kill Chain analyzing the probability of anomalous election results generated from touchscreen voting machines. And a question to you, Philip, is the film focused on voting machines and ballot marking devices. What other technology are you worried about? Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, well, Hari hinted at some of this uh, and Jeff as well. There was a lot of equipment that was available uh, at DEF CON at the Voting uh, Machine Village. Um, technology is involved in elections in a lot of different ways, ranging from voter registration databases to electronic poll books to the voting machines that Kill Chain really focused on to tabulation equipment um, and election night reporting, kind of the aggregation of results and the posting of, of results. Um, it's involved in things like signature verification to see whether someone who turned in an absentee ballot, whether the signature on the, on the, uh, the envelope matches their signature on record. And all of these things are vulnerable. Um, as Simon mentioned earlier, really what I think we should be focusing on is the quality of the evidence. How convincing is the evidence that the reported winners actually won? Um, and in order to have convincing evidence, it really is important to have durable, tamper-evident records. It's important to check that every voter, every eligible voter, in fact, had the opportunity to cast a ballot. It's important that the way that the ballot be marked uh, be done in a way that can't be hacked. Introducing technology between the voter and the paper trail, it makes the paper trail itself hackable. And that was a lot of the focus of the film. But even beyond that, once you have the paper trail, curating the paper trail and demonstrating that you've actually taken care of it, that no ballots have been added, lost, altered, et cetera, is incredibly important. Um, and then the tabulation of that needs to be checked. And that's where risk limiting audit comes in, is primarily checking the tabulation. Checking the tabulation of a trustworthy paper trail checks the result of the election. Checking the tabulation of an untrustworthy paper trail is still worth doing, but it doesn't check the result of the election. Um, and then finally, some of the big missing pieces are taking that tabulated result, aggregating it across jurisdictions, and posting the final result of the election. And that's something that I'm especially worried about right now, partly because many states outsource that to third parties, some of which are based in foreign countries. Um, I, I think that there's on the order of a dozen or more states that outsource that aggregation and posting to a company called Clarity Elections that's owned by CIDL based in Spain. Um, I'm really concerned about the reliance on that technology and uh, would love to see more checks to ensure that the ultimate results that are announced really do uh, match how things were tabulated, that how things were tabulated match how the paper was marked, how the paper was marked matches what voters intended. Great, thank you, Philip. Uh, our, our next uh, special guest for this Q&A session is Marilyn Marks. Uh, Marilyn is an activist and the executive director of the Coalition for Good Governance, the plaintiffs in the seminal Curling v. Kemp lawsuit, which 
found that Georgia's paperless touchscreen voting machines can no longer be used on constitutional grounds. Uh, question for you, Marilyn. According to press reports, Georgia's central election server was exposed to the world from at least 2014 uh, through the 2008, uh, 2016 elections. And after your organization sued them, the state destroyed the servers. Yet your organization has a copy recovered from the FBI. What have you learned about possible attacks on Georgia's system? Thank you so much for allowing me to join you tonight. One thing that uh, so many Georgians don't know about the system is that every single one of the 30,000 voting machines in Georgia are programmed in one office. And in 2016, that was Brian Kemp's office, the Secretary of State. The machines still today that are unauditable, um, no accountability whatsoever is possible, are all programmed centrally. And as you say, that central server was found to be open to the entire world. And um, that was found in 2016 by a young cybersecurity researcher that the world meets in the film Kill Chain. Logan Lamb is in, in the film and um, he stumbled onto the fact that the server was wide open. And um, when we sued the state in 2017, they immediately wiped the servers. Never mind that that was completely illegal, but they wiped the servers. But luckily, a copy had been retained by the FBI. And after two years of fighting, at the end of last year, 2019, we were able to obtain the forensic image from the FBI. We went back to Logan Lamb to ask the question, okay, you had proven that the whole world had access to Georgia's voting machines. Did anybody do anything about that? Did anybody do anything with that access? And Logan only had a short period of time to take a quick look before we had to give some um, big picture views to the court. The answer was not surprising that in 2014, some unauthorized entries, very big deal entries looked like they did take place by someone who then attempted to erase their tracks, erase their commands. And um, at the same time, before the server image was turned over to the FBI, the state deleted many of the logging entries and uh, much of the logs are deleted back to November, 2016. So the answer is, what could be found in a deep dive of this forensic image with millions of records? We don't know, but we deserve, we believe that this is a huge mystery that merits a deep, deep dive for the country to find out who got into Georgia's system, what did they do, what effect did it have? And those millions of records are just waiting for a forensic examination we hope we can go out and get a grant to be able to afford to do that examination. And I believe that the findings will be such that it will merit a sequel of Kill Chain. Thank, thank you, Marilyn. And thank you for your tireless advocacy in this field over so many years. I should have also mentioned that Marilyn appears in this film. Uh, and the last uh, special guest before we go to viewers questions is Jake Stauffer, who also appears uh, in this film. Jake is a security consultant in digital forensics and malware analysis. And he was hired by the state of California over a 10 year period to examine voting machines made by ESNS and Dominion. Uh, and Jeff, the question for you is you legally examine certain ESNS and Dominion voting machines for the state of California what major vulnerabilities in the voting machines did you find? And were you surprised? How did this make you feel about our democracy? Uh, well, thank you very much for uh, allowing me to uh, be a part of this. Um, so unfortunately, um, I'm still under a uh, non-disclosure agreement with uh, some of the, um, uh, the testing that we did do. 
Um, but what I can tell you is that some of the vulnerabilities that we uh, did found were staggering. Um, so I come from a government slash military background. Um, uh, the, the vast majority of my experience is performing forensics on uh, unclassified systems, classified systems, weapon systems, uh, also uh, doing a lot of the what we call uh, certification and uh, um, accreditation processes for a lot of those systems. And so when we started doing our testing for the California Secretary of State's office, um, we kind of took that, uh, that mentality um, using federal guidelines uh, for uh, system hardening and whatnot. Uh, and um, one of the things you'll probably see in some of the reports that we wrote was uh, based on these guidelines, these hardening guidelines, um, there were a lot of holes. Uh, there were a lot of things that were not done. Um, there were a lot of system patches that were not um, uh, up to date. Uh, on those systems. And so um, to be fair, uh, we really didn't spend a lot of time uh, creating elegant attacks against these systems because they already had so many holes in them that uh, getting into them was rather trivial. So um, one, of the, one of the things that was kind of staggering on our, our side was that um, uh, in one of our uh, uh, phone conversations with a vendor, and I, I won't say which one, um, uh, they had specifically asked us, well, what standards are you basing your testing on? And we told them we were, uh, we were using federal guidelines used uh, by uh, the NIST, the National Institute for Standards and Technology. And they said, well, we don't care about federal guidelines. We care about state guidelines, knowing that the state didn't have any guidelines at that point in time as far as uh, uh, system hardening and security. So uh, it was just one of those um, uh, eye-opening things um, uh, and uh, believe it or not, uh, when, we, uh, when we told them that we were using a uh, approved testing plan by California, um, they were kind of upset that we were using a different testing plan that they, uh, that they actually provided. Um, and believe it or not, they actually threatened to sue my company for, uh, for using a quote unquote unapproved testing plan, which really uh, at the end of the day, it was approved by the, the, our client, which was the California Secretary of State's office. So that, that kind of gives you kind of an idea of like vendor influence and, uh, um, uh, and this, this field, uh, unfortunately. So, um, but I, um, uh, as far as my thoughts on democracy and how do I feel about democracy, um, I've spoken on this uh, topic many times before. And um, uh, in a digital age, well, we have a tendency of uh, kind of relying on computer code, um, whether that's a barcode, um, or uh, something that's uh, performing something in the background. And at the end of the day, uh, if you can't validate it, if you can't verify it, then, uh, then we need to go back to paper. Uh, as um, uh, mentioned in Kill Chain, um, toward the end, I'd mentioned the fact that uh, get on a paper ballot, uh, uh, bubble in your little answer, uh, put it through a digital scanner, but uh, ultimately have some sort of audible proof that, uh, that you voted and this is the way that you did vote. Um, uh, because unfortunately, uh, as we have shown many times before, um, uh, in the electronic uh, or the, the digital uh, frontier, uh, unfortunately, like uh, Harry said, this is a man-made domain and that man-made domain uh, can be changed by man. So um, I think that uh, with the, the panel that we have here and the people uh, that are uh, very quickly getting on board, I think our democracy is gonna be safe. Uh, but only if we have people that uh, like you guys that will uh, go out there and um, 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 scream at the sky uh, or, or just say that this is something that needs to happen and, um, oh, and security should be at the, uh, the, the forefront of this, not an afterthought. Great, thank you, Jake. Uh, we will now go to viewer questions. We have a lot of them. Uh, we're gonna go to 9.30 Eastern time. Uh, which I know is a little bit longer than we planned, but we have a, a lot of questions we want to try to get to. Uh, first, from, from Jenny Cohn, who uh, is uh, very active on these issues, as many of you may know. She asks, what can be done to allow officials to determine in the event of another breach whether and to what extent uh, data has been changed? Uh, and I, I think she's referring specifically to voter registration uh, data, but, but also to uh, actual election uh, machine uh, and voting data uh, in terms of the tally. So uh, who wants to take that uh, question initially? Any, anyone want to start? 
on that. I'll go to maybe I'll go to Hari first uh, for for an answer on that question. So, unfortunately, uh, my answer is not going to be very nice. Uh, most of these systems have been built in order in a paradigm where you don't want to keep forensic evidence. So in a movie, when you see an official from DHS saying there was no evidence that uh, what the votes were changed, and the follow-up question was, did you look for evidence? Actually, the answer we didn't look for makes sense. Because when you know how the systems work, looking for the evidence, you know that you won't find it because the systems are not recording, generating, preserving, or protecting meaningful forensic evidence. And this is from the from the very beginning to the end of the process everywhere. So uh, the same thing when I uh, did work for Secretary of State Ohio back those days, uh, she was Jennifer Pranner, and she was asking me, well, there's no evidence that votes have been changed in these systems. And this was back in 2007. My answer to her was, please keep on using these systems and they will never be evidence, no matter what happens, because these machines are incapable of producing evidence of that and evidence of the other ones. These machines neither can prove nothing happened because they don't generate a evidence which can be used to defend the system against false claims of something took place. So this practice of avoiding to have evidence is prevalent across the whole uh, a, 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 a spectrum. And it's not only the machines, it's also the deployment plan. So there are a lot of third party elements in these systems. And you know, those elements might be capable of producing a lot of evidence, but for whatever reason, they are instructed to be configured and deployed in a way that they don't produce meaningful evidence. So that's one of the most important things in the way of we need to have transparency in the system is to use what is already out there, make them to collect the evidence, and then make certain that every new system is cre cre uh, creating, capturing, and then protecting a meaningful forensic evidence. Thank you, Hari. Uh, the next question comes from Eileen, who asks, so what can we do about the EAC certification, which is so outdated, Election Assistance Commission certification? The machines we use now are to 2005 standards. Who wants to take that question? Um, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll take that question. Um, so uh, that's a, a great question. And that's a, a big problem that we have is that the voting machines are being certified to 2005 standards. And uh, um, this is something that uh, some of the, the Senate senators have noticed and have been raising the question with the EAC. What's um, especially troubling is that the um, EAC has the power to stop certifying equipment to 2005 and require the vendors to certify to the more recent standards, um, as well as to move along the standards that they're working on right now. There, there are a set of standards from 2015, um, but the vendors bring the systems in and um, they would prefer to certify them to 2005. And the EAC says, okay, we'll certify it to 2005. And if your state statute hasn't been updated and it just requires any sort of federal certification, that's enough. And the EAC is, is um, not demanding or not sunsetting the 2005 standards and not insisting that the, state, the vendors test and uh, certify their, or, or bring their systems in for certification to the 2015 standards. Um, so I would say the best thing to do would be to reach out to your um, uh, senators and your Congress members, especially hopefully if they're on either the Senate Rules or House Administration Committee and um, raise this uh, to them and say they need to be pressuring the EAC to um, be uh, requiring the vendors test to the more recent standards. Great, thank you, uh, Susan and, and Philip. Yes, please go ahead. Just pile on a little bit. Um, I'm on the advisory board of the EAC and the cybersecurity subcommittee. Um, the VVSG 2.0 is nearing um, sort of approval. Uh, there was some final, what well, hearing actually happened earlier today uh, with public comments and there's, there's more to come. Um, 
as Courtney mentioned, you know, there are problems that you kind of freeze in stale operating systems and whatnot in the current way that certification is done. So even the newer uh, VVSG is going to be problematic in that regard. Um, I would prefer a really completely different approach to certifying equipment that in fact sunset is certification after some period of time and required recertification in order to ensure that systems got updated, upgraded, um, that the latest uh, security understanding and wisdom um, could be applied to these systems. One of the biggest problems with the VVSG and this whole certification framework is that the vendors have too many seats and too loud a voice at the table. A lot of this is really being driven by uh, the vendor's profit motive um, and not by uh, election integrity and the trustworthiness of our elections. Um, we really need to look much harder at how we can uh, ensure that certification uh, includes things like conditions of use. I mean, you can take uh, the most wonderful instrument and you know, misused, it basically becomes a doorstop. Um, how do you ensure that this equipment is used in a way that leads to trustworthy elections? That's missing. Modular certification is missing. It ought to be possible to certify subsystems and ensure that there are data interchange standards so that you can uh, replace one thing with, a, with superior technology as that technology becomes available without having to go back and recertify the entire system. So I think the whole certification framework right now is badly broken. Um, and uh, the EAC as a whole, is very cautious about stepping on the toes of the individual states. And that's gotten, I think, uh, to a point that it's pathological because they don't even issue best practices guidance around stuff because even saying here is the safest way to use this equipment is viewed as somehow in, in, uh, infringing on states' rights. Great, thank you, Philip. And uh, Jake, yes, please go ahead. So one of the questions that I uh, I always ask myself about the VVSG is there, there's there's one letter in there voluntarily. Why is it that security standards must be um, uh, be implemented voluntarily? Um, uh, the the federal government has a lot of really good hardening standards and a lot of security standards, and the vendors are ultimately uh, uh, banking on the fact that the states don't. So because uh, ultimately the states are the ones that run the elections. Uh, and so uh, my, my whole viewpoint on this is um, uh, at the very baseline, as far as like the system security side is concerned, um, we, we need to be using standards that are already out there, already proven, already tested, uh, and already implemented, um, uh, and that they should not be voluntarily, they should be, uh, um, uh, they should be mandatory. Um, uh, across the way, and that's going to ultimately help with a lot of the issues that, that we're going to see. So, so kind of scratch out that, that V part, that voluntary part, and make it an M, and, uh, and that's going to uh, help um, with a lot of this, the, secu the security issues that you're having right now. Thank you, Jake. I like that. Replace the V with the M. That's good. Uh, so I want to go to Sarah and Simon, uh, the producers and directors of this film with Russ Michaels, and ask about the specific revelation that, that we've highlighted among others that Susan talked about in letters to the Intelligence and Homeland Security Congressional Committees. And, and that is uh, the revelation about what happened with the Alaska uh, election infrastructure uh, and the hacking of that. Uh, if you could, uh, without revealing uh, too much because we want people to see the film, but if you could talk about um, you know, what you found there uh, and why you believe it's so concerning uh, for our democracy and for election integrity? So I, I think Simon may have gone to bed. Simon's actually in London. So yeah. in London, it's about two o'clock in the morning. Um, but I, I can answer that. And it's slightly unfair that it's me answering it actually, because it was Simon and Russ who tracked down Cyberzeist. Um, Cyberzeist is a very young hacker. He was sitting somewhere in India, we never knew where we don't know his real name but we do verify that he genuinely did what he said he did um harry verified it and we also had several other cyber security people look at what he said we we have a two and a half hour interview with him um which they reviewed and everything he said checked out um so what he did was get into the alaska voting machines Alaska systems into GEMS, which is the vote tallying system, and could have changed any vote. 
Um, when he was there, he also found that there were other people who had beaten him to it, um, that he had heard that, you know, Russian state actors, Chinese. So Cyberzeist was um, a real shock and it took um, Russ and Simon about six months to persuade him to speak to us. Um, he spoke to us uh, blacked out because he is terrified for his life at this point, I think probably. Um, um, but it was very brave of him to come forward. He wanted people to know. Um, he also wanted the people to know that, you know, he didn't think it was just Alaska. So um, it, it is a really uh, extraordinary revelation that he, he literally could have changed any vote. He didn't, um, uh, but he could have. Thank you, Sarah. And does anyone else on the panel, any of the special guests want to comment on this revelation uh, and what you think it, it means for the security of our elections this November and beyond? Yes, Ari. You're on mute, I think, still. One thing which has not been mentioned here, uh, but I will mention it on behalf of the filmmakers, is that uh, after the, uh, the interview and the severity of this thing became clear, uh, US and European authorities were informed way before the movie came out. So there was a responsible information going to the, the people who need to know on the government side. And so this, is, this was not a shock to them and all the right things were done. Has it been secured, Hari? Do, do you mean it's been secured? <laughs> well, that is not that kind of authority's business. Well, you see, Alaska continued to deny that this had happened. They had the FBI came in in Alaska and, and the FBI said nothing happened. So as far as we know, seeing as they continue to deny that anything happened, nothing changed. Philip, do you want to talk about this? Oh, uh, just slightly. <clears throat> One, I, I don't think it's surprising that that happened. Uh, we know that these systems are full of holes. We know that they're online even when they shouldn't be. It's just, it's kind of utterly unsurprising. I did want to say one thing in Alaska's defense uh, is they, they recently became the second state to perform a statewide risk limiting audit. It was of the Democratic yeah. primary. This happened two weeks ago. Great. Good to hear that. Hari, yes, go back. Go ahead. I also would like to point out that something which um, might sound a little bit of science fiction for people who are not insecure is a, the whole concept of lateral movement. How you get from one place, when you get your foothold, how you move inside of the system and how often when people say, well, those systems are not connected, they are not lying because they, don't know. are lying on purpose. They just don't understand how these things work. And there are a lot of times when systems have a, a common elements which are not even known by the people who are building it. And so they, they can be honestly telling, yes, there's no way from there to there until you have someone who is capable and say, I don't even see where the barrier is. And that's one part which I, I can sympathize with cyber science say, why they call it the air gap? I didn't see it because that's literally how often anywhere, not in LH, but everywhere, just you just don't even see the barrier which people thought is there. The same way as people say, well, our disks are encrypted. Well, when the system is running, it can access the disks. So very often the hackers are stealing stuff from encrypted disks and they didn't even know they were encrypted because they are hacking system which was already working and there was already the crypt piece for part of the system. So yes, you, you actually lose a fracking rights because you broke something which other people are, are proud of and you didn't even know. You didn't even know what they were fracking about. Thank you, Ari. Really, you go ahead. I, I really like that, the Indian hacker. Uh, he, he came across as very authentic. Uh, it reminds me of some, some people I've known in the past that you know they're, they're, they're driven for this exploration with maybe some nefarious purposes on the side. And the interesting thing is India is going through pretty much the same thing the States is. The, the uh, officials in India are saying that their systems are totally secure and can't be com compromised. 
Same thing in Brazil, same thing in Mexico. Um, so the United States is not unique in this regard. Um, but I would like to think that, that we have the tools uh, to, to create the standards or the legal system to force change. But you know, it's not, it's not just us. And you, that's pretty scary if you look at what um, some of the other authoritarian governments of the world are doing. You know, we need to build in some resistance. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you all, uh, the, all the distinguished panelists and special guests for joining us tonight. Uh, thanks again to Alyssa Milano and Senator Wyden for leading us off. Uh, special thanks to Sarah and Simon uh, for your leadership in making this film with Russ Michaels, uh, which again, we urge everyone to watch if you've not seen it on YouTube through May 25th is available for, uh, free for viewing uh, and to tell your friends and your family how critical it is. Uh, and thanks to all of you for joining us and viewing uh, tonight and participating in this critical discussion. The fight for election security. As Hari said in his opening remarks, elections are the cornerstone of our democracy uh, and we must be vigilant in standing up and fighting for the integrity of our elections and for the right to vote, which includes our right to have our votes properly counted. So that concludes our program uh, tonight. Uh, stay safe, everyone and keep on fighting for democracy. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye, Jeff. Thank you. Bye, Harry. Bye, guys. Thank, Thank you all. You.